Hello everyone, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today on this webinar for the Globalization and Development uh, Master's Program at SOAS. Uh, what I would like to do uh, today is two things basically. I want to first of all give a bit of an overview of the program, the kind of things that we will do, the expectations of students, um, the activities available to you in, in this master's course. And then I'm going to uh, finish with a short excerpt from one of our lectures, just looking at some of the themes that we will cover in globalization, in particular, what we mean by the term and some of the ways that we, um, we think about globalization uh, today. So to begin with, uh, I wanted to speak about uh, the themes of GND, globalization and development. Uh, there are basically four things that we cover in this course. Firstly, we look at uh, theories of globalization. As you will see, there's different ways of understanding uh, the term uh, and its implications over the last few decades. So we engage with all of these theories, reading, um, from, uh, from texts, discussions in class, trying to understand the, the underlying assumptions that lie behind uh, the different ways of theorizing uh, globalization today. Secondly, very importantly, connected to these theories are some of the empirical patterns and trends of globalizing processes. So we'll look uh, at a global level uh, around a range of different uh, 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 measures of globalization, uh, looking at how they've changed um, over the last few decades, looking at the impact of crises uh, on these things and what they might mean for uh, uh, people across the world. Uh, thirdly, very importantly, uh, we look at some of the social, economic uh, and political impacts of, of globalization. In particular, uh, one of SOAS's strengths is our, our focus on countries in the global south. Uh, so we'll be discussing in some depth uh, what does globalization mean and what might it mean in the future for poorer countries um, across the world. And finally, uh, as this is a development studies course, we'll look at some of the uh, relations uh, uh, or the, the connections of uh, globalization to areas such as sociology, ecology, political economy, politics, culture, and governance. We're very much an interdisciplinary uh, uh, course, uh, and so we cover all of these and many more uh, themes throughout the, the 20 weeks uh, of the course. So looking now, at uh, what are the what's the structure of GND? Uh, there are two full year core courses that you need to take uh, to graduate uh, with the GND masters. First of all, you need to take the core course itself, and in a second, I'll be showing you what the uh, what the outline the lecture outline for the course was for this year. And then, secondly, you take a uh, uh, another or you take two more. Sorry, you take uh, one of two core courses, either political economy of development or theory, policy and practice of development. These are large courses uh, that students from across a range of degrees uh, will be taking. Uh, and they cover, firstly, PED covers uh, issues of political economy. And secondly, TPP covers uh, some of the theories uh, and experiences of development globally. Over the last uh, over the last period, so you choose one of those core courses and you take your choice in addition to the globalization and development course. So for all of these core courses, there are uh, a one-hour lecture and a one-hour small group tutorial each each week. So they are in total. 20 week uh, courses, they run over two terms, 10 weeks each term. And in each week, you'd have two hours of contact time, one hour of a lecture and one hour of a small group tutorial, normally around uh, 10 people uh, in that tutorial. Uh, finally, or in addition to this, you will take four other term length modules. So these are modules that uh, uh, cover issues in much more depth. You can find a list of these modules uh, available uh, on the Development Studies uh, website uh, on the SOAS main site. Uh, and finally, very importantly, you will be uh, doing a writing a dissertation in, in conjunction with a supervisor uh, of 10,000 words. 
course. Uh, you need to pass this dissertation in order to get your master's degree. Uh, and it is up to you the topic that you choose. Uh, you discuss this in conjunction with a supervisor. And it's really an opportunity for you to uh, explore in much more depth uh, the, uh, a topic of interest uh, to you in the course. It has to be in re related in some way to the themes of globalization and development. But as you'll see, these themes are very broad. So you will be, uh, the, 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 the options available um, are, are quite wide. Okay, looking at the, uh, the course structure or outline for uh, this, this term. We have, sorry, there seems to be a problem with the, uh, with this slide. Uh, sorry, this, the slide is not seeming to work, but um, if I, I'll just uh, run through some of the things that we cover um, in the outline. Uh, so we begin with looking at uh, introduction to globalization and development. Then we talk uh, uh, around themes such as empire, imperialism, and US hegemony in the second week. Uh, thirdly, we discuss the unipolar moment, uh, in other words, the rise of the United States um, to global dominance. Um, and we continue this thing in the, in the following lecture where we look at some of the challenges to the US um, globally. And then the fifth week is uh, a lecture on neoliberalism. So we'll be discussing what is meant by neoliberalism uh, and its impact and relationship to the development of globalization. In week six, we look at financialization, and then uh, the, the rest of the term covers themes such as work and labor, uh, informalization of labor in developing countries, labor migration under globalization, and borders uh, uh, in the global economy. Uh, in the second term, we look at themes such as gender, uh, how we understand globalization and urbanization, states and global markets, globalization and agrarian change, uh, questions of ecology and uh, extractivism, uh, global labor movements, and then uh, themes around democratization, revolution and rebellion and their connection uh, to globalization. So these are some of the themes. If any of you are interested in looking at this outline in detail, please uh, send me an email and I'll be happy to, um, to send you the course outline. Uh, you can have a look at the kinds of topics we cover in, in further depth. Uh, moving on to the uh, assessment that is required for the course. This, there are three basic assessment pieces that you are required to, to uh, produce over the over the 20 weeks of this term. Firstly, a book review where you choose a book uh, related to the themes of the of the uh, of the course and write a review uh, worth 25% of your overall assessment. Uh, secondly, a set of five PowerPoint slides where you take one of the le lecture topics uh, from the term and you present the basic debates and ideas behind this lecture topic in uh, a simple PowerPoint uh, slides. And finally, the major piece of assessment is a, a, a 2,500 to 3,000 word essay uh, that reaches 45% uh, of your overall grade. Looking finally, uh, before I ask you if you have any questions, uh, at the some of the other activities at SOAS. One of the great things about being at SOAS is that there is a wide range of other regional and thematic centers uh, that you can become involved in as a student, as well as a number of lecture series uh, that uh, take place each week um, uh, at, at the school. So just to give you this, this is a very uh, uh, brief list. There are many more than this, but just to give you an idea of some of these things, uh, we have in the Development Studies Department a week seminar series that uh, uh, involves invited guests from the UK and across the world uh, presenting on their research and cutting edge topics and debates in development studies. There's also an agrarian change seminar series which uh, includes regular lectures on people by people who are working on themes of agrarian development um, and uh, again looking at experiences uh, in rural sectors across the world. The Centre for Migration and Diaspora Studies is a very active centre at uh, SOAS and has a weekly lecture 
lecture uh, with again speakers invited from around the world that looks at questions of migration uh, both in the UK and more broadly and then a number of regional uh, centres and institutes such as the African Studies Centre, South Asian Studies Centre and the London Middle East Institute uh, which all organise their own lecture series as well. So as you can see there's a, a really wide range of activities and we find that students uh, get a lot from these kinds of activities and in, indeed uh, uh, many say this is uh, some of the, one of the most enriching parts uh, of their time at SOAS. So before I move on to speaking a little bit more about globalization, I wanted to ask if any of you have any questions I might be able to answer. Please um, just uh, drop down your question in the chat box and I'll try to answer them. If not, I'll move on to uh, looking at what do we mean by this term globalization and what are some of the ways that it's been understood and theorized uh, 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 over the recent past. The first thing that I want to uh, note is that, as we'll see in this course, there is uh, a lot of discussion about whether globalization is actually a new phenomena or something that has existed for many, many, uh, uh, for many, many years. Uh, I have here a quote uh, that I think is quite revealing. Uh, can anyone tell me where this quote might have come from? Capital has to its exploitation of the world market given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. All old established national industries are dislodged by new industries whose products are consumed not only at home but in every quarter of the globe. In place of the old local and national seclusion and self-sufficiency, we have intercourse in every direction, universal interdependence of nations. Anyone know where this came from? This is actually a quote uh, that was written uh, around 1848. Uh, it's a quote that comes from the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels and the Communist Manifesto. Uh, and if we look at that quote, we can see what they're describing is something that actually appears uh, to be very relevant uh, to the contemporary world. Uh, Marx and Engels didn't use the term globalization, they called it instead the world market, but they much argued that these kinds of global interconnections uh, was, were intrinsic to the development of capitalism. In other words, global processes, uh, the, the, the pushing beyond national boundaries, the interconnection of the world market as a single unitary uh, 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 space is something that was very much bound up with the beginnings of capitalist uh, development. So uh, using these kinds of assumptions, many people have argued that we actually see rather than a moment of globalization that begins later in the 80s or 90s, rather waves or, 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 or cycles of globalization where the global uh, political economy is more or less integrated um, through uh, different phases. This is certainly true, but at the same time, we can see over recent years that there has been a, a, a very significant degree of openness and integration of the global economy. We can see this through a number of indicators um, that look at the way that national uh, boundaries and national units actually are becoming more and more dependent upon their exposure to the global. So just to look at a few of these uh, 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 indicators, here we have long-term trends in value and volume of merchandise exports. So this is a graph from UNCTAD, an uh, international organization that produces uh, regular reports that measures trends in globalization. And you can see here uh, that from the 1950s to the 1970s, uh, both these things, the value and volume of merchandise exports, were relatively stable. Uh, here we have on the left-hand axis, uh, uh, the uh, 0 to 250, with the year 2000 marked as uh, uh, 100. We can see in this period that uh, then there is a, a massive acceleration uh, that takes place beginning in the 1980s, but really increasing from the 1990s onwards uh, in both the, the, the value of and the volume of exports of goods coming from countries uh, around the world. 
this tells us uh, a very important fact. It tells us that uh, countries are becoming much more dependent upon their external exports, their exports to the rest of the world uh, in both uh, the, the scale as well as the, the, the importance of these exports to national economies. This is one measure of, uh, of globalization and it's something that we'll look at uh, in some depth as we look at patterns of trade uh, that have emerged over the last two decades. The other interesting thing about this uh, graph that I would like to point out is the drop that we see around 2008, where it's marked boom and global crisis. Uh, this was a period of extreme shock, the collapse of 2008 and 2009, and the ramifications of which we are still living with today. This global crisis saw a significant drop in both the volume and value of merchandise exports. Uh, and we can see it was preceded by a very sharp rise. Uh, so we'll look at the causes of this global crisis and what it might mean for uh, how we understand globalization. Another indicator uh, that also is frequently used when discussing uh, uh, these kinds of things are the cross-border capital flows. Uh, so here we have different kinds of cross-border capital flows, zooming in on that period 1980 to 2015. We're looking here at, in blue, the foreign direct investment, uh, yellow portfolio investments. So this is investments into overseas uh, stock markets, and then red banking uh, 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 flows, capital flows. Uh, so you can see again, Mirroring the, the patterns we saw in the previous graph, there's a very significant increase from the early 1990s up until that moment in 2008 when we see a very significant plunge in these cross-border capital flows. And then in the last few years, uh, somewhat of a pickup, but still much less than what we saw in the early or in the mid uh, 2000s. So again, these are some of the things we'll look at. We'll look at what do these capital flows mean for how countries relate to one another? What does it mean for ownership uh, of companies? Uh, what does it mean for the global uh, uh, growth of companies as they expand uh, uh, throughout the world? So I, it's important, I want to emphasize this globalization and development course is not an economics course. Uh, you're not expected to have a background in economics at all, uh, but it is something we will be discussing uh, as part of our uh, exploration of globalization, some of these economic indicators that are typically used uh, to understand uh, these patterns. So how do we understand these trends? This is a very important part of uh, our course. Uh, we look at some of the theoretical uh, approaches to understanding these kinds of uh, increased global integration. Um, one of these, uh, and a quite a dominant one, is this idea of liberalism or the liberal paradigm, which basically argues that democracy, free markets, and the rule of law are the natural telos of humanity. In other words, uh, these are the natural end point of, of, uh, of humanity, end of history. Um, and that reflects this increasing global uh, integration, reflects this uh, uh, natural end point. Secondly, we'll look at Marxist and world systems approaches, um, which, as I pointed out earlier, take the position that capitalism has always been global, uh, and that we need to look at very much concretely how capitalism has expanded across the world, looking at colonization and competition between nations uh, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and then uh, in more recent periods, uh, the kind of destabilization of the national state. In other words, um, uh, the, the importance of the global scale, the world market um, uh, to these processes. And then finally, we'll look at post-colonial and decolonial critiques. This, uh, this theoretical, this set of theoretical debates look at how do we tell the story of the global from a non-Eurocentric perspective? How do we understand uh, globalization processes uh, beyond simply uh, uh, the, the central European uh, 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 frames of analysis? 
So taking these uh, approaches, we look at themes relation, related to borders, uh, related to migration, ecology, finance, culture, labor, democracy. Um, we, we take up debates around whether this is a US-led process or, uh, very importantly, whether we're seeing the resurgence of new great power rivalries. In particular, uh, uh, we can see these debates unfold today uh, with the, the schisms and the tensions between the United States and China, um, as well as other uh, powers on the, global, uh, on the global scale. And then finally, we'll uh, very much engage with the question of whether we're seeing actually the end of globalization, the return of xenophobia, populism, uh, and the rise of far-right movements and governments globally. Uh, so uh, this kind of comprehensive account is what you'll get from the globalization and development degree, integrating these more theoretical questions with very topical debates about politics, about economics, and about our world uh, today. Please uh, feel free to drop me an email uh, if you have any queries about the degree program uh, or about SOAS in general, I'll do my best to answer. It's been a real pleasure and I hope to see you uh, next term uh, in, the, uh, in the GND program. Thank you very much.